Good evening. Thanks for joining us on India Business Hour. I'm Shireen Bhan. The headlines that we're tracking for you at this hour. The worst is yet to come once the International Monetary Fund, as it expects one-third of the global economy to contract this year or the next. Also cuts India's growth forecast by 60 basis points to 6.8%, but India remains the fastest growing major economy. Stock market slide across the world after the Bank of England intervenes in the bond market for the second day. The Sensex slips over 800 points. The Nifty loses over 250 points. All sectoral indices close in the red. JP Morgan's Jamie Dimon says the United is much more painful. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development releases a new global tax reporting framework for crypto assets, proposes automatic exchange of information between countries, mandatory customer identification along with the rules for exchanges, brokers and other operators facilitating trade in crypto assets. Ukraine's president asked G7 nations for more arms and ammunition after Russian missiles target Kyiv and other cities. U.S. President Joe Biden promises to provide an air defense system. Meanwhile, Russia declares Mark Zuckerberg's META a terrorist organization. The World Health Organization tells CNBC TV18 it never inspected Maiden Farmers' facilities or its products, refuting the company's claims, says the cup syrups linked to the death of 69 children in Gambia may have been contaminated at the point of manufacture, the exact cause still under investigation. The Chief Justice of India, UU Lalit, recommends Justice D. Bai Chandrachur as his successor ahead of his retirement in November. Justice Chandrachur will be India's 50th Chief Justice and will have a tenure of two years. European merchants set to accept payments via UPI-powered apps and rupee cards from Indian tourists. This after French payments company Worldline collaborates with NPCI's international payment arm. With the deadline for public comments fast approaching, experts say that the draft telecom bill needs immediate course correction. Says that the sweeping definitions need to be narrowed or will lead to jurisdictional overlap and disputes. And on what's ailing rural India, Rajasthan's garlic farmers burn their crop after prices drop sharply to unsustainable levels. Also claim the government support has fallen short. A special report coming up. Well, let's start with the market action. Weak global queue spooking sentiment on the Lal Street. The Sensex and the Nifty ended with cuts of a percent. The Sensex lost over 800 points today and the Nifty was down by over 250 points. In fact, all sectoral indices closing in the red. The Nifty has now slipped below the 200-day moving average. Mid-caps have seen sharper cuts than the blue chip. So that's the market story for you this afternoon. Meanwhile, the rupee ended the day largely flat, even as currencies across Asia tumbled against the dollar. The Indian currency traded in a narrow 9 peso range. Traders believe that the RBI is likely to have sold do dollars via state-run banks to limit the rupee's losses. 80 to 31 is the dollar rupee for the day. Speaking of central banks stepping in, the Bank of England has intervened in the bond market for the second time. The British Central Bank has announced an expansion of its emergency bond buying operation and said that it will widen its scope of purchases of UK government bonds. The central bank has warned that the sell-off in the UK government bond market poses a material risk to UK's financial stability. A move of this magnitude is highly unusual in the sovereign bond market of a developed economy. And staying with the global economy, JP Morgan's global CEO, Jamie Dimon, backed the Bank of England's intervention, saying they had little choice. Speaking exclusively to CNBC, Diamond also said the new British government under Liz Trust must be given the benefit of doubt after sparking market turmoil. Diamond has warned of a recession in the U.S. over the next six to nine months. He believes the S&P 500 could fall another 20%. Take a look. It's QT, which we've never had before. Uh, so therefore, the unknown effects, and you see it today in bond markets around the world, and sovereign markets and people selling U.S. Treasury debt, and it's the war. And these are very, very serious things, which I think are likely to push the U.S. Uh, and you know, the world. I mean, Europe is already in a recession, and they're likely to put U.S. in some kind of recession six, nine months from now. In hindsight, you know, they waited too long and did too little, and QT should have started sooner and all that. But they're clearly catching up. They're clearly motivated to catch up. And, you know, from here, we let's all wish them success and keep our fingers crossed that they that they manage to slow down the economy enough that it doesn't, you know, to cause it, whatever it is, is mild. Stock markets, where do you see the trough for the S&P 500? Oh, I don't know. You know, look, it, it, it may have a ways to go. I mean, it, it really depends on that soft landing, hard landing thing. And since I don't know the answer to that, it's hard for me to answer that. But it, it, could, it could be another easy 20 percent. 
And, uh, I, you know, I think like the next 20 percent will be much more painful than the first. Rates going up another 100 basis points are a lot more painful than the first 100 because people aren't used to it. And, you know, um, and I think negative rates, when all is said and done, will, will be a, have been a complete failure. While rates moving higher, stock markets lower. That's Jamie Dimon. Global agencies continue to downgrade growth forecasts for the world and India. Latest is the International Monetary Fund. It's cut its FY23 growth forecast for India by 60 basis points to 6.8%. This is lower than the RBI projection of 7% growth. But India remains the fastest growing major economy. Ritu joins me now with the highlights. Ritu, take us to what the IMF is saying. The big takeaway from IMF's latest report is that a third of the world economy will likely contract this year or the next and IMF warns that the worst is yet to come and for many people 2023 will feel like a recession. Let me begin with India's outlook where the growth forecast has been cut steeply to 6.8% for FI23, lower than RBI's projection of 7% for the year. IMF says this downgrade reflects a weaker than expected outturn in the second quarter and a more subdued external demand environment. India's growth is then seen slowing down to 6.1% in FY24 and at 6.2% over the medium term. Inflation is seen averaging 6.9% in the current fiscal and 5.1% in the next. And the current account deficit is seen at 3.5% for FY23 and 2.9% of the GDP the year after. Now, while the global growth forecast for this year is left unchanged at 3.2%, next year's forecast is cut by 20 basis points to 2.7%. IMF says the 2023 slowdown is going to be broad-based and this weak growth reflects significant slowdowns for the world's largest economies, that is the US, China and the Euro area. For 143 economies constituting 92% of the world GDP, the outlook is significantly weaker than earlier estimated. This growth outlook is the weakest, in fact, since the 2.5% growth rate seen during the global slowdown of 2001, with the exception of the global financial and COVID-19 crisis years. Now, IMF also says that inflation is now expected to peak at 9.5% this year before it slows to 4.1% by 2024 and it warns that it remains the most immediate threat to the current and future prosperity of the world. So far, IMF says the dollar appreciation appears mostly driven by fundamental forces, but this sharp appreciation adds significantly to domestic price pressures and the cost of living crisis for emerging economies which are already facing challenges. There are multiple risks it highlights to this outlook. Most importantly, that monetary policy could miscalculate the right stance to reduce inflation. More energy and food price shocks might cause inflation to persist for longer than expected. Halting gas supplies by Russia could depress output in Europe and so on. The 2023 slowdown will be broad-based, with countries accounting for a third of the global economy expected to contract this year or next. The three largest economies, the United States, China, and the euro area, will continue to stall. In short, the worst is yet to come, and for many people, 2023 will feel like a recession. The worst is yet to come. That is the IMF on the global economy. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has released a new global tax reporting framework for crypto assets. Now, the new framework proposes an automatic exchange of information between countries, mandatory customer identification, along with rules for exchanges, brokers, and other operators facilitating trade in crypto assets. The Indian government has been calling for global cooperation to regulate crypto assets. Remember, we didn't go through with pushing that bill in Parliament. Standing by with the details. Sapna, take us through the new framework that's been proposed by the OECD. Well, it's a completely new framework that the OECD is suggesting in terms of uh, not exactly regulating crypto assets, but basically reporting on crypto assets and helping countries share information among, among each other on the same. Uh, this is going to be discussed also in the G20 meeting of the finance ministers and the central bank governors, which is going to happen tomorrow and day after. India is very much represented there. Our finance minister and the RBI governor both are there with their respective teams. Uh, of course, we have to wait and watch and see what is going to be India's response to this. But uh, the new framework designed by OECD works on the simple premise, uh, same as that of the common reporting standards for tax matters, uh, which is basically you report on the uh, assets as well as you uh, help countries Please share information among each other. So you need a proper system, you need a proper framework for that. That is what is being suggested. 
uh, however the oecd is also suggested this month some carve outs basically those crypto assets which are used for investment uh, purposes or not used for investment purposes or not used for payments they may be given some kind of an exemption uh, interestingly enough the oecd is also uh, um, suggesting some amendments to the common reporting standards for tax matters uh, there they are saying that all kinds of digital financial products should be comprehensively covered uh, under the minimum standard so uh, i think all in all both are going to be uh, dovetail to each other uh, this is a this is a uh, you know a model that is it's a kind of a draft model being suggested on crypto assets india in the past is all, all has always maintained that you need a global system a global paradigm to uh, you know deal with cryptocurrencies and that is what is that is what is being proposed at least at the moment remaining we have to see how this really pans out over the next few months Yes, we will have to see. Thanks very much, Sapna, for joining us. Ukraine's President Zelensky has asked G7 nations for more arms and ammunition this after Russian missiles targeted Kyiv and other cities. Missile strikes by Russian forces in the capital and other key cities earlier this week had smashed civilian targets, killing at least 19 people and leaving over 100 injured. The Russian retaliation came after an explosion on the Kerch Bridge, which connects mainland Russia to annex Crimea. Putin had termed the incident an act of terror perpetrated by Ukraine. U.S. President Joe Biden promised to provide Ukraine an air defense system. Meanwhile, Russia has declared Mark Zuckerberg's meta as a terrorist organization. India voted to reject Russia's demand to have a secret ballot in the UNGA on annexation of the four Ukrainian regions. In corporate news, market regulator SEBI has approved the sale of LNT Asset Management Company to HSBC Asset Management. Remember, the 3,100 crore rupee deal has already received the green light from the Competition Commission of India. Once the deal is complete, LNT mutual fund schemes will be managed and operated by HSBC AMC. In the aviation space, sources tell CNBC TV18 that Jet Airways has identified five aircraft, including three A320 Neos and two B7378 MAX planes for its initial fleet. However, the airline is yet to sign the aircraft lease agreements. Jet Airways, in a statement last month, had said it is quite close to the October target for starting operations. However, we learned from sources that the relaunch is unlikely to happen this month. The Competition Commission of India is likely to issue final orders in the Google Play Store case. We learn from sources that CCI has come up with a penalty along with a suggestive remedy as part of the final order. Just to remind you that in 2020, Google implemented a 30% commission for all Play Store transactions, a decision that was widely criticized by the Indian stakeholders, startups mainly. The World Health Organization has refuted Maiden Farmers' claim, telling CNBC TV18 that WHO never inspected Maiden Farmers' facilities or its product. The UN agency has said that the cough syrups linked to the death of 69 children in Gambia may have been contaminated at the point of manufacture. Parikshit Lutra joins us now with more. Parikshit, uh, what more has the WHO told you? Well, the WHO has said that it's uh, working to ensure that uh, all the remaining contaminated uh, medicines are taken off the shelves in Gambia and other countries uh, where they may have been exported. They also confirmed to CNBC TV18 that they have not inspected nor certified or assessed any of the products made by Maiden Pharma. And this is a company that has an approval from the state regulator in Haryana. They also said that 72% of the cases of acute kidney injuries among children who took these medicines made by Maiden Pharma were children below the two years of age. At the same time, samples of medicines used by children came back positive for contaminants like diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. Uh, and all of these were traced back to the four cuff syrups made by Maiden Pharma. Uh, the cause of contamination is still under investigation according to WHO, but they said that the responsibility lies with the manufacturer and the point of contamination may have been where this uh, medicine was manufactured at the factory. Failure to observe good manufacturing practices may be a contributory factor, and uh, the contamination was discovered during investigation into the children's death. So a detailed investigation is still underway. They're sharing their analysis with Indian authorities as well. We are also awaiting the report of Indian authorities. Remember, samples have been collected from Maiden Pharma, even though it was not selling in the domestic market, but the regulator uh, is uh, investigating now whether there has been contamination at the point of manufacture, as WHO suspects. Parikshit, many thanks for joining us. Warren Buffett-backed Chinese EV maker BYD has launched its first passenger electric SUV in India called the Atto 3. The Chinese manufacturer has two plants in India with 3,000 employees, and it intends to sell 15,000 electric vehicles in three years. Bookings open from today with prices to be announced later.
GOBP and Mahindra and Mahindra have expanded their existing EV partnership. GOBP, which is a fuels and mobility joint venture between Reliance Industries Limited and British Petroleum, will set up charging network for Mahindra's upcoming electric SUV launches. Starting with 16 cities, GOBP will install DC fast chargers at M&M dealership network and workshops across the country. Bookings for the EV variant of the Tata Tiago have crossed the 10,000 mark by noon on day one itself. The company had offered an introductory price of 8.49 lakh rupees for the first 10,000 customers. It has decided now to extend the introductory price for the next 10,000 customers as well. Road and Transport Minister Nitin Gadkari unveiled Toyota's pilot project on flex fuel cars today. The Corolla Altus Hybrid is India's first ethanol ready flex fuel car. Such vehicles offer the flexibility to switch engine fuel from petrol to ethanol. Of course, this is not being launched commercially yet. We will head into a break, but up next, Rajasthan's garlic farmers burn their crop after prices drop sharply to unsustainable levels. A special report when we return. Now, India has had a bumper crop of garlic this year, and while that may be good news for consumers and the food processing companies which procure the crop, garlic farmers have been left with a bad taste in their mouth. In this latest edition of What's Ailing Rural India, CNBC TV 18 Santegora reports on what garlic farmers in Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan are going through. Take a look. Farmers of MP's Mansour district are burning their garlic crop because what was supposed to be a major source of their income this year has not yielded the desired results. Prices of garlic have plunged from 25 to 30 rupees per kilo last year to between 2 and 5 rupees per kilo this year. A pittance considering each farmer has spent anywhere between 35 and 40 rupees per kilo cultivating the crop over the last 6 to 7 months. They say if you throw in the additional cost of storage, Burning it is a better option. 70-100 rupees ka time hai, to supply karwa ke laye hain, aur 60 rupees kiraye ki de hain, aur kiraye ki dene ke baad bhi hain, 3 rupees kilo, 1 rupees kilo mein bhi tayar nahi hain lene ke liye. Abhi ye lassan hai, 4 rupees kilo kiri da hai. Abhi 1 20 rupees ka to cutto aata hai, 50 rupees gadi wale le lete hain. Ab roti bhi kaise khaye gayi khas gar. Madam ne unke liye rukhe to nahi ki jo sarkar ne wada kiya tha ki ham sarkar hi tolenge, wo tol ke intezar mein rukhe pehle the. और वो भी तोल नहीं हो पाया। उनके इंतजार करते-करते ये टाइम आ गया, खराब होने लग गया। दो रुपए, तीन रुपए दाम मिल रहे हैं। और हमारा मुनाबा भी नहीं निकल रहा, हमें कटाई के, निंदाई के पैसे नहीं निकल रहे, हमारे बहुत नुकसान हो रहा है इसमें। MP and neighbouring Rajasthan make up for nearly 80 percent of India's garlic production, and in Rajasthan's key garlic producing region of Kota, 43-year-old Kuldeep Mala from Badgaon village faces a big dilemma. इसको उगाने का तो ये है कि उगाने में छः महीने इसको लग गया और छः सात महीने अपने स्टोरेज में लग गया इसको और मंडी जाएंगे अब तो मंडी में दो रुपए तीन रुपए किलो पांच रुपए किलो बिक रहा है अगर बिकेगा तो बेच देंगे नहीं तो जानवरों को डाल देंगे कुलदीप स्नेहर रामकिशन माला विज़न द सेम बोट और लागत हमारी बीघे के हिसाब से 35-40 हजार रुपए पर बीघे की लागत लगती है हमारी सरकार ने भी हमें ये आदेश किया था कि टोकन बनाएंगे और किसानों को टोकन के आधार पर 35-40 रुपए पर कुंडल के हिसाब से इधर हम आपसे लसन ले लसन लेंगे हम मगर सरकार ने प्रलोभन जगह झूठ बोल करके उन्होंने इतना धोखा किया सरकार ने उसकी वजह से हमने मतलब इसको ज़्यादा रोका नहीं तो पहले भी अगर हम बेच देते तो कम से कम पच्चीस तीस रुपये पर कुंडल पर किलो के हिसाब से बिक रहा था there are multiple reasons for this crisis. For one, the acreage of garlic has increased by 13 to 14 percent in the last three years, resulting in a bumper crop this year. Then there were the export curbs imposed on garlic, which meant that farmers were not able to avail the higher international prices that prevailed. The bigger problem they say came from the imports of garlic bulbs from China, which have bigger cloves and are easier to peel and use, making them preferred by Indian consumers and dealing many garlic farmers in India are kicked to the gut. Looking at the total area that is sown under these crops in these states and the average land holding size, one can estimate this number to be anywhere between one and a half to two lakh farmers uh, that are involved in garlic farming. Uh, on the monetary loss front, 
uh, there can be different ways of analyzing the data. But in terms of the notional revenue loss, uh, we see that the prices have declined by about 50% on a YOY basis. And that translates to about 6,200 crores uh, of a revenue loss. Setting up processing units at local levels can solve this problem by a huge margin. Experts say that these processing units, which will convert garlic into garlic powder and garlic paste, will increase the shelf life of the produce and will also improve the negotiating power of farmers. Over the years, every government has promised help in setting up such processing units, but none of those promises have been kept. In Badgaon Kota, with camera person Milan Wagmari, this is Santya for CNBC TV18. Well, that's one of the issues ailing rural India. Chief Justice of India, UU Lalit's brief tenure is set to end next month, and he has nominated Justice D.Y. Chandrachur as his successor. If Chief Justice Lalit's recommendation is accepted by the government, Justice Chandrachur will become the country's 50th Chief Justice. Ashmit Kumar takes us through the crucial judgments delivered by Justice Chandrachur in the past. Ashmit. The Supreme Court is all set to welcome a new Chief Justice of India, a man who, even before assuming office, has been making headlines. Current CGI, Justice Yu Lalith has nominated Justice D.Y. Chandrachur to take charge as India's next and 50th Chief Justice. Now, Justice Chandrachur is currently the second senior most judge in the top court. He's likely to assume office on November 9th. He'll have a long term of about two years compared to just about two months for Justice Yu Lalit. Now, here's some interesting trivia. His father, Justice Y.V. Chandrachur, was also a Chief Justice of India, 16th uh, to be specific. This, in fact, will be India's very first father-son duo of CGIs. He's had a distinguished career as a jurist, first uh, as a judge in the Bombay High Court and then as the Chief Justice of Allahabad High Court. Uh, he has to his name over 460 judgments with quite a few notable ones. Among the few landmark cases uh, is the judgment in which Justice Chandrachur decriminalized Section 377 of Indian Penal Code, removing the legal bar to consensual sex among homosexuals. In the Sabri Mala case, he called the practice of bar on women's entry as untouchability, allowing women to worship the deity. In the Aadhaar case, uh, he was the only judge in a bench of five to question the constitutionality of Aadhaar. He red flagged the safeguards, la lack of safeguards rather, and the possibility of surveillance through the Aadhaar regime. One of his biggest contributions has been his role in declaring privacy to be a fundamental right. He was a part of the landmark nine-judge bench, interestingly, uh, in holding uh, privacy to be a fundamental right. He overturned his father, Justice Vaivi Chandrachur's judgment of 1976. In the Love Jihad case, he held that courts had no role to play in a marriage between two consenting adults. In fact, more recently, his verdict extending abortion rights to both married and unmarried women was also widely celebrated. He also extended the right to transsexual persons. His role in pushing the Supreme Court towards live streaming of constitution bench hearings has also been lauded. But his actions have also invited some criticism. He was widely criticized for not even dissenting in a five-charge bench judgment that paved the way for the construction of the Ram Mandir in Ayodhya. He's also responsible for rejecting a plea seeking a probe into the death of Justice B.H. Loya. Recently, uh, we also saw a complaint being filed before the president alleging a conspiracy by Justice Chandrachur to pass orders favoring the clients of his son. The complainant also alleged that the vaccine makers made crores of profits due to his orders. And in fact, just 24 hours before his nomination, a collegium resolution named him for objecting to current CJI's letter proposing names of judges to be elevated to the top court. He's already one of the most talked about faces in the judiciary, if not the country, and at least in the first few days of his taking charge as Chief Justice, his actions and rulings will be subject to detailed public scrutiny. Ashmit Benny, thanks. Uh, that is uh, India's next Chief Justice, Diva Chandrachu. Let's take a look at the startup space. Arundhati Ramanan joins us now with the key highlights. Aru, take it away. Thank you so much for that, Shireen. Here are the top stories from the startup world. The funding winter gets colder as investment in Indian startups plummets by 80% year-on-year to $3 billion in the September quarter. This, according to Traction, funding falls across stages, but late-stage startups suffer the most with a 70% drop. Meanwhile, European merchants set to accept payments via UPI-powered apps and rupee cards from Indian tourists after French payments company Worldline collaborates with NPCI's international payments arm. Now, Indian cricketer MS Dhoni picks up stake in plant-based meat startup Shakahari. The investment follows Shakahari's recent $2 million seed funding route led by Better Bite, Blue Horizon and Panthera Peak Ventures. Now, early investor in Tesla, Skype and Coinbase Tim Draper invests in Up, 
a smart connected home appliances startup from India. The round also saw participation from the founders of Unacademy and Ather Energy. With that, it is back to you. All right, Anandati, many thanks for joining us. That is the Startup Snapshot this evening. And with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of India Business Hour. But before we go, we focus on the draft telecom bill, which aims to replace three laws that currently govern the sector. The draft bill is in the public domain for feedback. It proposes to bring messaging apps under licensing purview, provide powers to suspend internet services, and make KYC mandatory for user verification for telecom service providers. Experts I spoke to told me that the draft telecom bill needs immediate course correction. You can catch that show coming up at 9.30 p.m. where I speak with the former Telecom Secretary R. Chandrasekhar, Supreme Court lawyer Gopal Jain, Apar Gupta of Internet Freedom Foundation and Rahul Mathan of Tri Legal. That's it then on this edition of India Business Hour. Thanks very much for watching. Stay tuned. The news continues on CNBC TV 18.